Hello and welcome to Within the Frame. I'm Handan in Seoul. It's been six months since the war between Israel and Hamas broke out in the Gaza Strip, but violence rages on and the humanitarian crisis worsens. Talks between the two sides remain in a deadlock as fears grow over Israel's possible invasion of Gaza's southern city of Rafah, where over 1.5 million civilians are taking shelter. Concerns are also rising over an expansion of the war as tensions escalate between Israel and Iran-backed forces in neighboring countries. Israel-Hamas war six months on. That's the topic of our discussion today. And joining us in the studio is Choi Hyun Jin, associate professor at Kyunghee University's Department of Political Science. Thank you for coming in. Glad to join within the frame. Also with us tonight is Aidan Hayher, Reader in International Relations at University of Westminster. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Professor Che, let's start with you. Israel and Hamas, they were expected to resume talks mm -hmm. over the weekend, but talks weren't materialized. Uh, the Hamas leadership, they did not show up at mm -hmm. the scheduled talks in Cairo. Mm -hmm. uh, and Israel has also recalled most of its delegations. Mm -hmm. What is the main cause of the long deadlock between the two sides? Uh, yes, the talks in, uh, between Hamas and Israel in Cairo, Egypt, have not made much progress because both sides have a demand that the other side finds unacceptable. So, for example, the Hamas proposed a ceasefire deal that includes several stages and specific demands. Uh, including the release of Israeli hostages in exchange for Palestinian prisoners, as well as a permanent ceasefire and a complete withdrawal of all Israeli forces from Gaza Strip. However, the Israel believes that these Hamas demands are not realistic, uh, saying that even if there is a long pause in the fighting, the war will not end until Hamas is terminated. So this conflict between Israel and Palestine has begun since 1947. And since then, there has been numerous attempts for ceasefire and peace agreement, but those efforts have not made a permanent peace. And therefore, the Israel does not believe a word such as permanent ceasefire. And also, from Israeli point of view, a ceasefire and the withdrawal of Israeli forces from Gaza will only give Hamas a chance to regroup, rearm, and prepare for another surprise attack against Israel in the future. And therefore, the both sides have a different opinion. The Hamas wants a permanent ceasefire, while Israel wants a complete victory. And therefore, it is hard to narrow the gap between these two different perspectives. So I think that's the key. Uh, Hamas is demanding a permanent ceasefire mm -hmm. as well as withdrawal of Israeli troops, mm -hmm. uh, whereas Israel is uh, strongly against that, calling it unrealistic. Mm -hmm. um, and the ultimate, the only and ultimate goal for Israel is total victory over the Hamas militants. Yes, it is. Uh, and so, well, truth be told, uh, it seems like there is no breakthrough, at least not for the time being. It's, it's hard. Uh, now to you, Professor uh, Hayher. All the while, Israel is not letting up with its attacks on Gaza, and mediators are still attempting to maintain an open channel of communication between Israel and Hamas. What's your assessment of where the two sides stand in their negotiations, and what are your prospects? Well, I would agree with my colleague there that the, um, the Israeli position is, is one where they, they want complete victory, and anything less than that they see as unacceptable. Uh, I think it's important to, to note that this really isn't a conflict between Israel and Hamas. It's, it's a conflict between the Israeli government um, and the Palestinians as a whole. You know, the tactics that Israel um, is using are not uh, um, targeted. They're clearly not just aimed at um, um, degrading um, Hamas. They are an attempt to uh, ethnically cleanse um, Gaza of Palestinians, um, the, the summary execution of, of, of medical staff, the bombing of hospitals, 
um, you know, significant evidence of war crimes. These are all tactics employed by Israel um, to destroy the Palestinian people as a whole, uh, rather than Hamas. And un unfortunately, if you have one party to a conflict that seeks the complete annihilation of the other party, it's, it's almost impossible to have any kind of negotiations with them. Um, um, Netanyahu and the Israeli government more generally um, have evidently calculated that they're, they're so far steeped in blood now that they might as well keep going. They can't turn back. You know, they, they, they're the only way that they can survive um, politically is if they manage to um, achieve their, their, their ideal of a, a complete victory, which therefore means that negotiations are almost impossible. And, and, and that has significant implications, of course, for the Israeli hostages that are being detained by Hamas. And, and that's caused significant unrest uh, amongst the Israeli people themselves who have been demonstrating against the tactics um, in, uh, employed by Netanyahu Jr. negotiations. So unfortunately, so long as you have a, a government in, in power in Israel at the moment that is so extreme, that is, is so um, evidently willing to engage in the most heinous barbarity, um, the chances of there being any negotiated settlement are, are, are very slim. And your remarks are being echoed by many experts around the world that the likely trajectory over the next few months at least will be much more bloodshed than a durable ceasefire. Now, Professor Che, Israeli officials held virtual talks with their U.S. counterparts on Monday, and according to the White House, Israel has agreed to take Washington's concerns over Rafa into consideration, but it remains unclear if the talks will stop Israel from pressing ahead with its uh, invasion of Rafa. What are your anticipations? Uh, yes, the Washington and Jerusalem held a virtual meeting to discuss about planned invasion of Rafa. The Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said like this, we will enter Rafa because there's no victory without eliminating the Hamas fighters in Rafa. So, however, U.S. President Joe Biden has expressed a strong concern about this invasion plan because such an action would only worsen the humanitarian crisis in Gaza Strip, leading to more civilian deaths. And the President Biden urged Israel to ensure the safety of the Palestinian people currently sheltering in Rafah. So there was a virtual meeting between these two sides. And as you said, after the meeting, the Israel said, we will take Washington's concern. So I guess these two parties, Washington and Jerusalem, have discussed to find a possible balance between Israel's security needs and Rafah's humanitarian needs. But unfortunately, I think finding such a balance is very difficult. Uh, this is because Hamas fighters are now hiding among Palestinian people in Rafah. So that means there would be no Israeli victory without entering Rafah. Yet, any ground battle in Rafah will generate a serious number of civilian deaths. So uh, I, I really hope that the, both the United States and Israel will prioritize civilian lives over winning the battle in Rafah. Uh, according to CNN, the U.S. officials presented their Israeli counterparts mm -hmm. with some other alternatives mm -hmm. to an assault on Rafah. Um, but um, again, the meeting ended with no breakthrough or, or any promises. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is uh, very concerning indeed. Now back to you, Dr. Hayher. Uh, we're seeing some signs of an expansion of the war in the Middle East. Iran vowed a decisive response after a strike. It blamed on Israel killed two of its top commanders and five others at its consulate in Syria. And this came after Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant hinted at Israel's reported airstrikes in Syria and Lebanon, saying that Israel is transitioning from defense to pursuit of Hezbollah. Why is Israel preparing for an escalation of conflict against Iran-backed forces? Well, again, I think it's important to, to um, understand the nature of the Israeli government at the moment and, and to really appreciate why they're doing what they're doing. That, um, 
the man you quoted there, Yov Gallant, uh, he's the guy who described the Palestinians as, as human animals and called for a complete siege on Gaza. Um, the, he, he openly said he wanted to starve um, the people of Gaza and, and deprive them of, of water. So this is a man who has um, publicly expressed the desire to commit a, a mass atrocity. Um, so the nature of the Israeli government is, is you know, one which appears to have, um, you know, very little compunction about um, breaking not just international law, but, but just basic moral standards. Um, and in, in terms of their regional ambitions, what they evidently seek to do now is to try to, um, you know, cover their own um, actions by creating a regional conflict. If they can um, you know, inspire other countries to become involved in this, uh, enemy states like Syria and Iran, then they hope that that will mean that their Western allies will come in on their side to fight what would appear to be a, a regional conflagration. So, you know, again, it, it shows how completely morally bankrupt the Israeli government is, that they are actually trying to inspire a regional war in the hope that that will then camouflage their own actions in Palestine and force their Western allies to come in uh, on their side. And it's an extremely um, dangerous tactic and one which, of course, could cause a massive loss of life throughout the Middle East. Uh, uh, and as I say, it's uh, a damning indictment of the, uh, the, the, the morality and the, the lack thereof of the Israeli government. So Israel is intentionally widening the conflict in the region uh, in, as part of efforts to camouflage their own action and also perhaps to uh, get the Western uh, powers, the Western allies involved in, in the conflict as well. Now, Professor Che, the UN Security Council adopted a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire, mm -hmm. uh, but Israel is continuing with its attacks in Gaza, asserting that the resolution is not legally binding. How do you perceive the current situation and are there any additional measures the international community can take? A uh, so-called resolution is a strong action that the UN uh, Security Council can take. And the resolution are usually considered legally binding. But however, this resolution has led to a debate over its interpretation. For example, the US representative to the UN said that she didn't agree with everything in this resolution but she did support some of the critical goals in this non-binding resolution. And Israel also argues that this is not legally binding, saying that this uh, war against Hamas is a self-defense self measure for Israeli security. So the using force for self-defense is the only type of military action that is allowed by UN Charter. And therefore, that's why the Israel says it's non-binding. Right? But however, the Chinese representative argues that this is legally binding. So, but however, I believe that uh, there is more important issue than binding or non-binding debate. The real important issue is whether it is possible to enforce this resolution. So I think it is not easy. Because even if Israel does not comply with the resolution, the United States, which is a uh, close Israeli ally, will not allow Security Council members to push for economic sanctions against Israel. So President Joe Biden uh, is running for re-election in this November. And therefore, he is unlikely to take a position that would anger the Jewish voters at home even if Israel is criticized by the international community. And therefore, I believe that it is not easy to enforce this resolution because of the possible veto uh, of the United States. And therefore, in sum, uh, it is not easy to enforce this resolution, regardless of whether it is binding or non-binding. So uh, whether it's legally binding or not, it's, it's not as important as actually finding practical ways to implement the right. resolution. But that also seems quite bleak for the moment, especially with the U.S. presidential election mm -hmm. coming up. Uh, Professor Hayher, according to the Washington Post, the U.S. has quietly approved 
transfer of warplanes and weapons to Israel worth $2.5 billion. Given that the U.S. has been trying hard to talk Israel out of its planned invasion of Rafah, how do you interpret this report? Well, again, like my colleague said there, it is important to understand that the geopolitics um, surrounding this particular situation. Obviously, the, 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 the massacres that are taking place on a daily basis in, in Gaza at the moment could be stopped immediately if Israel wanted to stop it. Uh, Israel doesn't appear to want to stop it. But if the United States stopped supporting Israel and took a very forceful stance against what Israel is doing, then that would likely um, stop the violence. Now, as much as the Security Council uh, resolution, which is, I think, most international lawyers would say it, it is by definition um, binding. But as much as that was welcome, uh, it's very difficult to, again, as my colleague said there, see how that's actually going to be enforced in practice. And, and the fact that the United States is calling for a ceasefire whilst actually supplying Israel with these weapons is a, a massive contradiction. And it's worth noting that these are weapons that are designed to kill civilians indiscriminately. You know, the, the, one of the missiles that they've sent to them is a 2,000-pound bomb, which um, can inflict damage on, on people 1,000 feet away. So you hit a target and people 1,000 feet away are killed. It is, by definition, indiscriminate. It is not the type of weaponry you would use to target um, Hamas fighters. It's the type of weaponry you would use to destroy civilian populations, to, to inflict damage on, on a wide, wide area. And Israel has proved itself time and time again to be more than willing to commit um, war crimes, to uh, target uh, civilian areas, you know, not inadvertently, but to actually specifically target um, hospitals and, and slaughter people um, in that particular way. And the United States is supporting that. The United States is supplying Israel with the weapons it is using to commit war crimes. And in, in that context, then, it is ultimately leaving itself open to being charged with complicity in uh, war crimes, um, if not genocide. Well, the U.S. has been uh, openly for a very long time urging Israel to dial back on its attacks in Gaza. And so this approval does send, as you've pointed out, uh, an entirely different signal, a huge contradiction there. Uh, Professor Che, France is reportedly seeking to put forth a draft resolution at the U.N. Security Council that includes all the criteria for a two-state solution mm -hmm. of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The solution has has long been supported by the international community, including the U.S., but Netanyahu is strongly against it. What is a two-state solution and what's your take on it? The two-state solution proposes establishing an independent Palestinian state alongside Israel, living in peace and security together. So this concept is based on the resolution of a territorial disputes and also ensuring both people's rights and sovereignty. And this idea has brought international support uh, as a fair approach to ending the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But however, achieving this solution faces significant challenges, including disagreements over borders, the status of Jerusalem, and security concern, and the political conditions within both communities. There's Palestine and also Israel. So my take is that while the two-state solution is very ideal for, uh, for peace, but the actual implementation is difficult to, to succeed. The biggest challenge comes from the political nature of a Palestinian community, community itself. The two-state solution assumes that there is a single Palestinian community. But however, in reality, there are two rival factions. The one is Hamas in Gaza Strip, and the other is Fatah in West Bank. And they are rival, and they are geographically separated, and also they even went to civil war each other in 2006 and 2007. And therefore, my question is, who can represent the Palestinian community? And who is the partner for Israel? And who can control the, this Palestinian community? So we need to uh, uh, settle this problem first before implementing the two-state solution. So a two-state solution would be ideal, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's 
implementation is much more challenging than we think uh, due to all the complicated political issues that need to be considered before we actually start uh, discussing the implementation of a two-state solution. And Dr. Hayher, we also want to hear your take on the two-state solution. Well, it, it's taken over six months for the UN Security Council to agree to a resolution calling for a ceasefire. You know, the idea that we can now move to um, creating a two-state solution is, is patently ridiculous. Um, this is a, a, an idea that's been floated by, by countries that want to um, appear to be engaged and appear to be doing the right thing. But th th this is, is not something that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, it's, 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 you know, we can't even get Israel to agree not to commit genocide against the Palestinians. We can't get Israel to um, stop um, uh, famine in um, the Palestinian territories. The idea that Israel is now going to agree to a two-state solution, uh, it, it's just utterly implausible. It's, it's obviously what the vast majority of observers of this conflict for decades have been saying is the only viable solution, but there are significant um, issues that need to be resolved, significant obstacles that need to be overcome, particularly the status of, of Jerusalem. Um, and again, as my colleague said there, the, the, the fact that the Palestinian territories are not uh, joined together is obviously a major issue. But, but really, at the moment, the focus shouldn't, cannot be on um, a two-state solution. It has to be on stopping Israel from committing mass atrocity crimes against the Palestinians. So the two-state solution seems like a distant dream for now when the international community can't even get Israel uh, to comply with a ceasefire resolution and stop famine and stop the humanitarian crisis that's worsening in Gaza. Uh, well, more than 32,000 Palestinians uh, have been killed. And like I mentioned, the humanitarian crisis only worsening. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's really the innocent civilians mm -hmm. uh, that who are getting affected the most. So hopefully, uh, although the outlook looks bleak, uh, hopefully Israel and Hamas will find a way to meet halfway. Thank you so much, Professor Hayher, as well as Dr. Che, for sharing your insights with us. And that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you for watching, and be sure to tune in same time tomorrow to join our conversation. Goodbye for now.